to throw herself energetically into a campaign. I was having lunch uh, with some friends in the country and the telephone rang and it was Margaret Thatcher on the phone and uh, she was very brisk in her normal style. She just simply said, uh, hello, Simon, he's pure gold. Uh, and I, I kind of startled at this and I thought, you know, partly who and what. Um, he's pure gold, pure gold. But Mrs. Thatcher's interventions were not always welcome. During a farewell visit to Conservative Central Office, she said that whilst she might be leaving John Major at the controls, she would still be a very good backseat driver. I was very alarmed. I was very alarmed because I could see immediately that it was going to cause damage. If I agreed with her policies, I would be seen simply, as the Labour Party put it, as the son of Thatcher. Where I disagreed, it would be said that I was wrecking her legacy. And so I saw from the outset that that remark would cast a very long shadow indeed, and it did. It was the first part of the wedge that was to come between us. The press was already on the case. With Margaret Thatcher's support, John Major's campaign to win the leadership of the Conservative Party and to become Prime Minister became unstoppable. You could sense from the body language of the people in the tea room that something had changed. A week or so ago, I'd been the Chancellor of Exchequer who would sit down and have a cup of tea and a bun with them in the tea room. But there was just this separate, rather slightly more tense atmosphere when I walked in. And it was uh, uh, compelling. I'm very pleased the way the campaign's going, thank you, but uh, some way to go. And it was then that I thought it was uh, possible, perhaps even probable, that I might win. The results of the secret ballot of Conservative MPs to elect the leader were announced in the evening on Tuesday the 27th of November 1990. Michael Heseltine, 131. Douglas Hurd, 56. John Major, 185. <laughs> The election could have gone to another round, but Douglas Hurd and Michael Heseltine both conceded defeat immediately. I congratulate John Major. I thank him and Douglas Hurd for an absolute... John Major success. is the right leader for this town. But he's a jolly good fellow. After only 11 years in the House of Commons and just three and a half years in Cabinet, John Major became leader of the Conservative Party. I'm very pleased with the result. This is At the same time, Mrs. Thatcher returned from the House of Commons, where she had voted for John Major, to join the celebrations in Downing Street. We went upstairs to the main state room in number 11, where there were maybe 100 people, I suppose, gathered. Um, and I saw one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. When John walked up the stairs and into the room, the entire room shifted from around Margaret to being around John. And it was as though one actually had seen the power shift from one person to another. And there really were only two or three people left talking to Margaret. It was an extraordinary sight. Mrs. Thatcher was keen to join her successor in front of the cameras outside. But John Major was mindful of her recent comment that she would be a good backseat driver. Margaret said very warmly, oh, well, I'll come out with you. And, of course, that would have absolutely played upon that image. And it would have been a very uh, bad start. It, I think it would have been bad for her, and it would certainly have been, been pretty bad for me. And so Norman Lamont, um, how he did it, I don't know, but with, with great skill, disattached her. And I went out to see people on my own. Now, in retrospect, I rather regret that. Because although it would have meant a little short-term criticism and a little short-term mockery from the Labour Party, I think it would have been more gracious to have gone out with someone who'd been Prime Minister for 11 years. It is a very exciting thing to become leader of the Conservative Party, and particularly exciting, I think, to follow one of the most remarkable leaders that the Conservative Party has ever had. Mrs Thatcher was forced to watch events from an upstairs window. It was another rebuff, and added to the bitterness she and her friends felt after her enforced removal from office. We're going to unite. We're going to unite totally and absolutely and we're going to win the next general election. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all very much. Oh, I think it was 
appallingly hurtful. It would have been one thing to have been voted out of office by the people. You can understand that. That's what happens in a democracy. But knifed in your back by your own MPs, lily-livered beggars that they were, you can imagine how that hurt. <laughs> The following morning, the tearful Mrs. Thatcher left number 10 for the last time. Now it's time for a new chapter to open, and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He'll be splendidly served, and he has the makings of a great prime minister, which I'm sure he'll be in very short time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. What she called treachery with a smile on its face, and others dubbed a daylight assassination, left its mark on the Conservative Party for many years to come, and would poison John Major's premiership. I think it made it very difficult for him. Uh, a lot of the people who supported him, and whose support he needed, uh, harboured a sense of, uh, of guilt in some cases, and resentment in others that uh, Margaret Thatcher had been deposed in the very rough way that she was. And there was this background of Queen Over the Water, which um, she did nothing to discourage, and which certainly made his life difficult. As Mrs. Thatcher was driven into the wilderness, the machinery of government went into action, with its routine yet ruthless efficiency. John Major left Buckingham Palace where he was having an audience with the Queen and returned to number 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister. On the way, he mused about his astonishing rise from a boyhood in Brixton to be leader of his country. After I left the Queen, the car began to drive down the Mall. It's a very short journey from the Mall to number 10. It had occurred to me it was a very long journey from Cold Harbour Lane to number 10. And I decided to set out before I went into number 10, precisely what it was I most passionately cared about. And I scribbled some notes on the back of an envelope. And that was the origin of the statement I then made. In particular, I want to see us build a country that is at ease with itself, a country that is confident, and a country that is prepared and willing to make the changes necessary to provide a better quality of life for all our citizens. What I had in mind was an end to the poll tax riots, an end to the bitterness and the hostility that we'd found on the doorstep, an end to the exclusion of many of the minority groups who felt they were outside the race to prosperity that we'd seen throughout so much of the 1980s. Those were the matters that were in my mind when I spoke outside Downing Street and when I turned to walk through that black door for the first time as Prime Minister. John Major's words on the steps gave a signal that he would not slavishly follow the woman who had championed his rise and whom he now replaced. The change in outlook caused much difficulty in the years to come. I, I think she thought that he would be a second generation Thatcherite who would want to advance uh, what she may have seen as the Thatcher revolution rather further. Whereas I think John Major came to office thinking that he should try and calm it all down. I think he wanted rather more consensus and rather less confrontation. Oh, yes, of course. Right. John Major was a very different character from Mrs. Thatcher. He was far more sensitive to criticism, and given his extraordinary background, seemed more vulnerable, and understandably, perhaps, lacked her self-confidence. He was a young man, younger than we'd had as Prime Minister for quite a time. He was a relatively inexperienced man. It was a big step. And I remember him coming in that first morning and saying rather disarmingly, I don't know if I can do this job. I wasn't really expecting it yet. Without the long years of experience of Mrs. Thatcher, John Major was far more reliant on the advice and views of his colleagues in Cabinet. The change in leadership style was immediate. Thus far, it seems to go well. Are there any other further comments on community business? It was much more what a Cabinet government is supposed to be like much more rational and you know, that's how any sensible person would think you might conduct a cabinet. Of course the problem was when people began to be disloyal later on uh, they were not very frightened of him. John Major's informal personal style and easy manner endeared the new Prime Minister to those who worked with him. He always disliked grandiose official functions and state banquets 
It was a marked change from the pomp of Mrs. Thatcher's court. At the beginning, he disappeared and gave the slip to his security guards to go up to Victoria Street to find himself a McDonald's. Um, and he always had, and he always had very simple, very simple tastes. Uh, didn't like rich food, didn't like heavy cooking, and um, was much more likely just to have a takeaway or something simple up in the flat than to want to plough through five courses. When he was at the Treasury, John Major was always happy to join staff in the canteen. John preferred beer and uh, well-done burgers to rocket salad with things that had been drizzled over or seared. Very nice indeed. <laughs> I think that just says <laughs> that he was um, very English um, in his tastes. I've always had this idea that people want to elect an ordinary person to be prime minister, but once the person is prime minister, they want that person to be rather exceptional and not, and not very ordinary. So for instance, when, when John Major was going to Happy Eaters and so on, I, I just thought that was a, a wrong interpretation of, of, of how to do things. There are certain trappings that go with the office, and I, I, I just, uh, I wasn't very happy with that approach. The immediate challenge for this untested new prime minister was to become a war leader. In August 1990, four months before John Major had become premier, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces had invaded Kuwait. In response, thousands of British and American troops, together with air and naval forces, were sent to the Gulf. Just one week after taking office, John Major flew to a wintry Washington to meet President Bush for talks about the crisis at his Camp David retreat. At first, the Americans had been unnerved by the rapid removal of Mrs. Thatcher but it soon became apparent that John Major's style was much more in tune with that of George Bush. Indeed, it seemed to be a relief for the president not to have to deal with Mrs. Thatcher. The Prime Minister has been very fruitful, from, at least from the United States standpoint. With John, I felt totally relaxed all the time, and we could make say jokes, and, and uh, he, was, uh, he was very easy for, for Barbara and me to be with, to be around to have in our home. Not that Margaret was difficult, but it's just, it was just a different dimension there. President Bush liked informality. He liked to relax up at Camp David with jeans and cowboy boots, feet on the table, beer can in hand, uh, while Mrs. Thatcher was there in high heels, handbag, and tweed suit. Um, of course, John Major fitted much more easily into George Bush's idea of a chap, somebody you could sit down with and be at ease with somebody you could wander around wearing a pullover, have a walk with, have a chat with. But there were deadly serious decisions to be made, including the date of the forthcoming Allied offensive to retake Kuwait. The thing that impressed me is Major could well have said, look, I've just taken over. Let me call my defense minister. Let me call somebody else over there and and uh, get the cabinet together when I get back. I'm sure we'll be with you, but I'd feel more comfortable if I had my team on board. Nope. Uh, he said, absolutely, you can count on us 100%. Never flinched. We'd be side by side every inch of the way. This conflict had the potential to unleash a range of horrors. The Prime Minister was in command of Britain's nuclear weapons and would have to be ready, if necessary, to use them against Iran. 